And Jesus, in his wonderful ways, just asked the question back. Well, I'll tell you the answer. If you uh, can tell me the answer to this question, John the Baptist, his baptism, his authority, did it come from heaven? Or was it of human origin? Was it from God or was it from people? And they decide, well, if we answer one way, we're kind of doomed. If we say it's from God, then we're kind of lying because we didn't think it was before. And if we say it's from humans, um, well, guess what? Then all those other people who support John the Baptist, then we mess up there. And so they say, we don't know. We're not going to tell you. And Jesus says, well, then I'm not going to tell you either. One of the things I say about Jesus' statements, his role in the Gospels is that he says far more challenging statements than comforting ones. Notice Jesus didn't say, oh, that's okay, guys. How about a big group hug? Oh, no. It's a challenge. And then he tells this parable. Two sons. He tells them both to go out to work in the vineyard. And the one son says, mm, no, nah, not so much, Dad. But changes his mind and later goes. And the other son says, sure thing, I'll go out in the vineyard. And doesn't. And that's when Jesus says, those tax collectors and prostitutes, they are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. He was comparing that first son who did God's will to the folks who weren't getting the right answers and then did. And that second son to those religious elite, the ones who went to church every Sunday. If that parable doesn't have you at least a little afraid or quaking in your boots, read it again. That's the point of it. All throughout the Gospels, Jesus is consistent, always challenging the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Herodians, all the groups who said, We've got the right answer. We know the way. You other people don't have it. We've got it. You don't. That's what Jesus was challenging. Here's a story I want to share with you all about my teenage years, and I think I've told enough of those stories to, so everybody knows I was a wonderful teenage um, child of my parents and always doing the right things. But here's another story about how I consistently messed up. So Monday through Friday, it would go like this. Our first bell at Minot High School was at 740. That was basically, that was the bell to say, you've got five minutes to get to your classroom. And second bell was at 7.45. And if you were not in your seat by 7.45, by that second bell, then you were tardy. That's when the consequences started. And so, Monday through Friday, it would go like this. My mom would come into my room at about 6.45, about 55 minutes before first bell, would kind of do the kick thing on my bed and shake my mattress and say, Lyle, it's time to get up. And I would turn over. And then she'd come in my room again at about 7 to wake me up. That's when I'd probably pull the cover over my head. And then she'd come in again about 7.15, and then now she was mad by this time and was saying, nope, you're going to be late. And about two or three minutes after that, I would be getting out of bed. And that left 
very little time to get ready and to get in my seat by 7.45, because now we're talking 7.18. So I'd roll out of bed, and my pattern was this. I'd brush my teeth, probably just swallow down a bowl of cereal real quick. I'd then be in the car by probably 7.25. And I had a meticulous route planned out. I'd come out on 7th Street onto University Avenue to a right, all the way down to 3rd Street, stop sign number one. Take a left, all the way down to 4th Avenue, stop sign number two, straight down 3rd Street, over the 3rd Street Bridge, take a right at Bridgman Creamery, where I'd be along Railway Avenue, which had not been fixed in about 50 years. So, um, one day when my mom was wondering why our shocks were so bad, it was because of Railway Avenue and my brother. We both did the same thing. And we'd drive down Railway Avenue, probably at a speed that's not legal, turn around, go the railroad tracks, um, pat to the library, stop sign number three, straight, Stop sign number four, take a right onto Burdick Expressway. Down Burdick Expressway a little bit, left into the parking lot. And then I was at school. So I managed to find a way to get all the way across town in about 12 to 13 minutes with four stop signs, no traffic lights whatsoever. And I would sit in my desk at about 7.43, with two minutes to spare. This is just one more story from the list of why I used to call my mom every Mother's Day and apologize. So, what's the point of this story? What kind of justification would I use, justification, how would I justify it with my mom um, of why I would take so long to get out of bed. Mom, I make it to school on time with two minutes to spare. What about so-and-so down the street who doesn't even go to school? What about my friend so-and-so who just decides to show up halfway throughout the day? make it with two minutes to spare. The reason I tell this story is it's because it, it flips the world a bit on its head like Jesus was doing. Which one did the will of the Father? The one who said, no, I'm not going to go out into the field, but ended up going anyway. He was just kind of late. And the other one said, yeah, I'll do what you want, Dad, and exit stage right. Switch one is completing the task. This is an awful parable for everyone who finds themselves in a pew every Sunday. Because we come from a place of saying, we've got the right answers. We're doing the right thing. All those others out there have got it wrong. So if you're not quaking in your boots yet, I'm going to have you do one of those turn and talks. Here's the question. Past, we'll say, the last 100 years, the church as a whole, not First English Lutheran Church, the church, the wider church, um, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being low, 10 being really good, how loving has the church been to everyone? Go ahead, turn and talk. Okay, I'll call you back. Just shout out some numbers. How loving has the church been in the past 100 years? Five. Five? Seven, eight, four. 
six. Um, my conversation, um, it went to, I was about a two or a three. Um, Ardeth, my elder, um, said a seven. It's perfect, perfect uh, paradox there. And when I answer a two or a three, I think of things like, and I said that past hundred years, and I say things like the Holocaust. And for those who don't know about how the Holocaust happened, it happened entirely with the participation of Protestant state churches and Catholic churches in Europe who full-on participated. Or the civil rights movement in which was stalled by many churches in the United States in the 60s. So I come from that kind of angle and from the generation I'm at, especially in urban areas in which you have people who are not affiliated with the church whatsoever in an organized way. And my elder answered to me, church has done lots of good things too. On an individual level, a relationship piece. Part of our prosperity here in the Midwest is because of the early church in the 1900s. Social fabric. We have an entire social service system which is based primarily upon the work of the church in the early 1900s. What's the biggest um, social service provider in the state of Minnesota? At least the private one? Lutheran Social Services. Has that Lutheran for a reason. And that's the history of the church. It's dualistic. On one hand, showing up a little late to the game, saying, no, Dad, I'm not going to do this, but going out into the vineyard anyway. And the other hand, saying, sure, you bet, Dad. I'll go work in the vineyard and then not. Where's the gospel in all this? We're pretty convicted on really how we fail to live up to what we're called to do. Where's the gospel? I think the gospel is found in that first son. Not because he decides to listen but because in the end, does the second son win? No. We all mess up. We all get to play the part of that son who doesn't listen. But at times, even when we don't want to, even when we don't want to roll out of bed, even when we pull the covers over our head, God's will still happens. God's will still happens, and in the end, God wins the day. That's the gospel. Even in spite of our worst, God's will, God's goodness still reigns. Even in spite of us. Martin Luther in the small catechism, in his uh, writing about the Lord's Prayer, and you can all recite it easily. If I say, thy will, be done. And he answers, what does this mean? He says it's not a prayer that, you know, we pray to God that, hey, your will can happen, please. No. We pray this prayer knowing that God's will is going to happen anyways, even without our praying it but that we might understand and know that God's will happens to us. It's a gift. He's pointing to the gospel. That even though we don't want to go work in the vineyard, we don't want to go to school, in the end, God's grace, God's will still happens. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. <laughs>